Our, our second speaker is uh, Deborah Charch. She's going to be talking about harnessing potent immune agonist pathways through kinetic and molecular engineering. Thank you, James. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? Okay, good. We can't hear anything up there. Thank you, SITSI organizers, for this opportunity. And I appreciate everyone staying here late on a Friday night that's raining. Thinking about this topic, it's interesting when we think about how ideas that are established, after a period of time, they start to feel kind of tired. But then time goes by and, and there are new developments and we kind of come back to appreciate these, new, these old concepts that now seem maybe new again. So it feels like that's the thread in the Cytokines Reinvented session, so I'm honored to be part of it. Please see my disclosures. I'm a consultant to, uh, and former employee of Nectar Therapeutics and a consultant to Third Rock Ventures. Looking at this table of approved and in development cytokine medicines, we note that these are endogenous proteins and they all have important jobs in our bodies already. And we generally understand the biology of these jobs. From the approval dates, you can see that these have been in medical practice for quite some time. And unlike drugs where we, like a small molecule or an antibody where we have to screen, these cytokines already exist. So it's kind of easy to find a development candidate. What may be also underappreciated is that most cytokines are agonists of their pathways. This makes them particularly appealing because it's actually difficult to develop an antibody that's an agonist, for example. The problem is that these endogenous small proteins are not ideal exogenous medicines due to their poor pharmacokinetics, poor tolerability, and functions which are dependent upon time and location. So let's focus on the IL-2 pathway because we, we're gonna, we've been hearing about other cytokines from the other speakers in this session. The IL-2 pathway has a special role in this cytokine story. Its job in the body is to function as T-cell growth factor. It's literally food for T-cells. The recombinant form of IL-2 was cloned in the heyday of what used to be called genetic engineering. And it was the first immunotherapy drug approved in 1992 for metastatic renal cell carcinoma. And then again in 1998 for metastatic melanoma. And the company that made this drug was called Chiron. And does anyone remember? I'm not, maybe I'm not supposed to mention a company, but uh, I, I mention it just because my first job in biotech was, uh, was at Chiron. I was a bench scientist. And I distinctly remember um, going to the patient days. And these were people who were effectively cured of their metastatic renal cell carcinoma. And they were on clinical trials in the 1980s, if you can believe that. So they were coming back a decade later. But high dose IL-2, unfortunately, is a misery for patients. There can be severe treatment-related toxicities that are neurological or gastrointestinal or cardiovascular. And on rare occasions, this can unfortunately be fatal. Treatment must be confined to an inpatient setting like a hospital. And in addition, this small protein is cleared super quickly by the kidneys. So the dosing has to be repeated in this confined setting every eight hours, which hammers these organ systems with each and every IL-2 burst and three times a day. So although staying on therapy, it's known that you can increase the chance of a cure. It's, it's rare that most folks can actually stay the duration of the full course. And then once the checkpoint inhibitors became approved, high dose IL-2 quickly faded out, primarily because of the toxicities, the dosing regimen, and the hospitalization requirement. On top of all that, modern immunological studies reveal that IL-2 is actually two-faced. The effects are pleiotropic, acting on both T effectors and on T rex. The IL-2 system, of, of the receptor system, is pretty complicated, and it presents a dichotomy. Please look at the crystal structure on the left-hand side where the IL-2 protein in the purple ribbons 
is docked into its heterotrimeric receptor complex. It's already complicated, which consists of an alpha chain coming from above in the dark blue, and the beta and gamma chains, which are the light green and light blue down at the bottom of the purple chains. The full heterotrimer of alpha, beta, and gamma has the highest affinity for IL-2 ligand. And this IL-2 receptor alpha, beta, gamma, and I'm just going to call it alpha for short, is constitutively expressed on regulatory T cells. But importantly, it's transiently highly expressed on activated CD8 T cells. So it takes a very low concentration of IL-2 to activate Tregs or provide positive feedback on act for activated effector T cells. And that's shown by the cartoon on the left. On the other hand, naive and memory CD8 T cells, gamma delta T cells, and NK cells persistently express the heterodimeric IL-2 receptor beta gamma, which I'll just call beta for short. This complex has a lower affinity for IL-2, which explains why high-dose IL-2 is needed for oncology, whereas chronic low-dosing IL-2 is sufficient for generating Tregs to treat graft versus host disease um, or autoimmune conditions. The IL-2 receptor system is complex. Not only are there concentration dependencies that we just discussed, there are also temporal or time dependencies. The graph on the left exemplifies what I mean by temporal or kinetic effects, which in our bodies is actually controlled by cells. Please focus on the IL-2 receptors alpha and beta, the two key subunits of the, of the IL-2 receptor complex. Please note the green curve, which shows the delayed yet transient upregulation of alpha on activated CD8 T cells and the persistent expression of beta shown in the light blue on long-term memory CD8s. Now we need both of those CD8 phenotypes for durable anti-tumor response, and their receptors have a clear kinetic component. But hang on now, so alpha is also persistent on Tregs. So while we want to support those activated CD8s for an anti-tumor response, we don't necessarily want to support the Tregs in the tumor. So it's a conundrum. It's a T-effector, T-regulatory conundrum. So knowing everything we know now about high-dose IL-2 for the treatment of cancer, and given that we believe cytokines like IL-2 have this kind of maestro-like um, coordination of the immune system, I came up with a cytokine scorecard for the properties that maybe could improve the efficacy and tolerability of this agent. It would be really good, I think, if we can mimic the kinetic effects of IL-2, because we know IL-2 doesn't act all at once. And we'd like an improved dosing regimen for patients to avoid the hospitalizations and toxicities. We know TILs, or tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, are key for an effective immunotherapy. So we'd like to enhance and sustain those, which I may call CD8s, such that the activated CD8s win out over the Tregs in the tumor. But maybe some Tregs in the peripheral tissues is not such a bad thing. So I would argue that a high CD8 to Treg ratio in tumor, but a lower CD8 to Treg ratio in normal tissue is a reasonable goal. So let's review a few examples that seek to overcome the primary challenges of high-dose IL-2. In the first example on the left, IL-2 is engineered with four mutations so that it only binds beta-gamma. In fact, the affinity to beta-gamma is about 300 times greater compared to affinity to alpha. This is a remarkable complete switch of how endogenous IL-2 works. This agent expands peripheral CD8s and NKs. It does not activate peripheral Tregs, as advertised. In published preclinical models, this agent is active against pretty small, just palpable tumors when dosed once a day. Another interesting strategy shown on the right is IL-2 permanently fused to its receptor alpha, which by virtue of being pre-bound becomes selective to beta. This molecule expands peripheral CD8s and NKs, but not peripheral Tregs. 
In preclinical studies, this agent was dosed three times a day or more and was active against mouse melanoma lung metastases. Please note that that's a fairly sensitive preclinical model, so it's just something to be aware of when you're evaluating mouse tumor models. These beta-selective agonists abolish binding to alpha, so they also abolish the activation of Tregs in the periphery. But maybe some Tregs is not such a bad thing. And there's also a nagging concern that these beta-selective IL-2 agonists may not support activated CD8s, because we know that those activated CD8s need that positive feedback through their transiently upregulated alpha. Data on CD8s in the tumor microenvironment were not reported for these agents, as best that I'm aware. To address the dosing frequency problem of high-dose IL-2, an antibody component can be added. In this example on the left, an antibody to FAF was fused to a mutated form of IL-2. The mutation in the IL-2 molecule you see that you see hangly, hanging off the, um, the end of the antibody is, uh, is, is meant to abolish binding to receptor alpha. So in that sense, the IL-2 component of this agent is similar to the two I just described. In the clinic, peripheral CD8s and, and NK cells are increased. Peripheral Tregs are not increased. And true to the design, the agent is dosed only once weekly, which is certainly an improvement over every eight hours or once a day. Now, we have to assume in this case that the FAP target is actually expressed on the tumor. This agent recently showed interesting clinical activity, but there was a fairly high number of adverse events. Data on CD8s and NK cells in the tumor microenvironment were not reported as best that I know. A subtle, alert, a subtle strategy engineers IL-2 through complexation with a monoclonal antibody, and that's shown on the right. In this case, the monoclonal antibody is non-covalently bound to the IL-2, and it's masking the IL-2 piece that would interact with the receptor alpha. This method does not seem to obliterate alpha binding, and so does not seem to obliterate peripheral Tregs. This biases rather than selects for activation of beta to support memory function. Now, we might, have, we might expect such an agent would also support activated CD8s through that positive feedback loop due to its alpha upregulation. This might be a difficult agent to develop, however, because one would have to make two GMP biologics, the cytokine and the antibody, and we have to make sure that this thing is, stays stable throughout its life. So the IL-2 pathway is pretty subtle. So please recall that activation of the responder effector T cells over a time scale, occurs over a time scale, and doesn't occur all at once. This is why in our own labs, we decided to kinetically engineer IL-2. In fact, we did not do any protein engineering at all to the IL-2 amino acid sequence. We instead used the same FDA-approved amino acid sequence that's been around for decades. Please look again at the crystal structure on the left-hand side with the purple ribbon IL-2 molecule docked in the heterotrimer. Rather than alter the amino acid sequence, we chose to add a synthetic modification in the form of a releasable polymer of polyethylene glycol, or PEG. The PEG polymer chains are co-localized at the interface between IL-2 and its receptor alpha. This design was actually inspired by the IL-2 monoclonal antibody complex we just talked about. This effect should bias or nudge the activation towards beta, as shown on the right. The subtlety here is that this does not obliterate binding to alpha. So it allows for that strong positive feedback loop to the activated CD8s, which are transiently upregulating their alpha. We further coordinated the kinetics of the bias signaling by letting the IL-2 activity unravel itself over time, as opposed to letting the IL-2 work all at once. In the initial state of Nectar 214's time course, there are at least six chains a peg. At, so at first, the Nectar 214 molecule does not bind any IL-2 receptor. It is not bioactive, and that's by design. In vivo, as each peg chain falls off stochastically, the daughter conjugates each become increasingly more active. So the bias towards beta is preserved, and additive as throughout the 
course of this cascade of all these daughter species. Importantly, the kinetics are tuned such that we never actually detect free IL-2 IL from the cascade in any mouse, monkey, or human study. Because the IL-2, when it's, once it's made, it's cleared so fast, it's cleared faster than it's made. So it's never there. So free IL-2 is simply not in the picture. So let's review one example of how this design dramatically affects the in vivo pharmacodynamics compared to IL-2. The graph below the release cascade is measuring PSTAT5 signaling in vivo, just downstream from target engagement. The red spike over on the left of the graph is the, is the situation of signaling after administration of IL-2 to a mouse. Within two minutes, we have a sharp peak of activation, which very quickly returns to baseline. So it signals all at once. And this explains why we have to dose IL-2 so frequently. In contrast, after one single dose of Nectar-214, shown in blue, the signal peaks in 24 to 48 hours, and the signal lasts for nearly a week. This kinetic profile is more akin to a natural cellular type response. And this is the reason why we can dose Nectar-214 like an antibody in the clinic. It's actually dosed once every three weeks, which nicely matches up to the schedule of many approved checkpoint inhibitors. Importantly, Nectar-214 is currently being dosed on an outpatient basis, unlike the hospitalization requirement for high-dose IL-2. We extensively modeled the receptor occupancy dynamics that occur during that cascade I showed you, so please refer to our pu publications for that. Let's see how this subtle effect of nudging the IL-2 away from alpha and towards beta impacts the phenotype of the tumor microenvironment. So now the punchline here is that time after time, this bias effect produces a massive increase in the CD8 to TUAG ratio in the tumor microenvironment. But in peripheral tissues, the CD8 to TUAG ratio is more balanced, which is maybe not such a bad thing. So what I'm showing here is one example for Nectar 214 in the blue triangles compared to IL-2 in the red. And please just focus on day seven. Each symbol in this graph represents an individual large established mouse tumor. The CD8 to TUAG ratio is well over 400 after just one single dose of Nectar 214 single agent, compared to a ratio of about 18 after five daily doses of IL-2. In this model, about 40% of the tumors, of the cells in the tumor are CD8s. They literally flood the compartment. The high CD8 to TREG ratio is persistent even 10 days after that one dose. Importantly, and this is really the take-home message here, the CD8 to TREG ratio is more balanced in peripheral tissues. It's about 10 in the spleen. We believe this is important from both an uh, efficacy and tolerability standpoint, because we really only want that effector response in the tumor, not in the normal tissues. We work with many great collaborators, so I wanted to point out that this dichotomy between the high CD8 to TREG ratio in the tumor and the ratio being more balanced in peripheral tissues has been shown in several independent laboratories in different models and with different combinations of Nectar-214. On the left side are data from the Tony Rebus lab. In their hands, the CD8 to TREG ratio was around 1,200 in tumor versus about five in spleen. In the Overvik lab, in B16 model at the top row, the CD8 to TREG was around 2,800 in the tumor, but only about 80 in the spleen. And in yet another model shown below that, the CD8 to TREG was over 200 in the tumor, but only about 1.5 in the spleen. Now the mechanism for this dichotomy between tumor and normal tissue is truly fascinating. And in the interest of time and as a teaser, um, I'm going to direct you to the poster from Sharma et al which describes a fascinating mechanism for why Tregs get depleted in the tumor through an interferon gamma and TNF alpha activity. So this data really demonstrates that when there is positive feedback for activated CD8s, and if they have proper IL-2 food, 
It creates a situation where the CD8 simply win the numbers game, particularly in the tumor microenvironment. From in vivo imaging studies with the Rebus lab, we find that the CD8s home to the tumor, and importantly, they persist. These imaging results are consistent with the flow cytometric data. The graph on the right shows that we can repeatedly dose Nefta 214 without losing activation in the tumor, as shown by the green line, after the first and second dose of 214. On the other hand, by the time we get to the second cycle of IL-2, which is the one shown in purple, the cells just don't want to do it again. So from the, and also from the single cell data we have, we know that the CD8s in the tumor are highly polyfunctional, secreting two or more cytokines. So these are really jacked up CD8s. The totality of this data indicates that there is a tug of war between T effectors and Tregs regarding the IL-2 signaling pathway. And for an effective immune response, we want T-effectors to win over Tregs in, the, in this tug of war in the tumor, but I believe we want to keep the Tregs around in the peripheral tissues. It's gratifying that this important dichotomy I mentioned between tumor and normal tissue manifests in human clinical studies involving Nefta 214. Do the data to date indicate that the bias design and the, in, and the ensuing pharmacodynamic response actually is translating pretty well between the mouse and the human. So coming back to where we started, let's please take a look at the cytokine scorecard. This, and let's see how these engineering strategies I discussed fix many of the issues related to high dose IL-2. As far as kinetic control, only NECTA 214 provides controlled and sustained activation of IL-2 signaling. The goal of minimizing frequent dosing seems best met by IL-2 agonists that employ an antibody or a polymer conjugation. Although not much data on TILS has been reported for many of these agents, it would seem that the antibody-based designs, or NECTA-214, might, might best support the, uh, and sustain the TILS. My personal opinion is that we should be also be aiming to support peripheral Tregs as much as we can because that may um, provide an additional safety margin. All of the agents except the FAP-targeted immunocytokines do not require the expression of a particular target on the tumor. And three of the agents are in active clinical development. So taking a step back, I tried to put cytokines in the context of other immunotherapy strategies. I roughly averaged the cytokine-based approaches so please consider this a very rough generality. But cytokines do have a, many desirable properties and can function as exquisite regulators of the immune system without requiring a tumor target necessarily or overtly risking autoimmune disease or toxicities. The trick is to understand the biology well enough so that we can engineer cytokines to match the desired outcome. This may help turn cytokines into better medicines that will fit into the IO landscape. Finally, if you would like to learn more about kinetic engineering, please visit some of these posters. Um, there's one on a TLR agonist and on, on um, IL-15 receptor agonist. And there's a, a ton on interesting combinations, including one with a PARP inhibitor using very novel models of ovarian cancer. It's been a privilege to work with ex excellent colleagues at Nectar and with great scientists at the academic institutions we collaborate with. With everyone's hard work and heads together, we may turn cytokines into useful medicines. And I wanted to give a particular shout out to Dr. Mario Snow. I don't know if he's here, and if he is, he's probably embarrassed. Um, but he was a very early supporter of this research um, on the Nectar 214. He was a believer and a supporter with a healthy dose of skepticism at the same time. So um, we'll hear more about the um, uh, clinical update from Nectar 214 from Dr. Adi Diab in a moment. So please stick around. And I thank you for listening to this IL-2 story.